This is uh, coming from a Deadline, as you can clearly tell. I think everyone's probably already heard this, but uh, this is being reported by Anthony D'Alessandro. And this is Michael Keaton in early talks to reprise Batman role for DC Universe, starting with The Flash. So it says Deadline has confirmed that Michael Keaton, who first played the big screen version of Batman in 1989 for Warner Brothers, and its 1992 sequel, Batman Returns, is in early talks to return to the role once again. Keaton would play Batman in a Nick Fury-like role, starting with Warner Brothers' The Flash, starring Ezra Miller, and could continue to play The Dark Knight and other upcoming DC movies like Batgirl. Reportedly, the Keaton Batman won't impact the mythology being hammered out by Matt Reeves' reboot, The Batman, starring Robert Pattinson as the Cape Crusader, and will pick up his storyline after... Batman Returns. Andres Machete is directing The Flash from a script by Birds of Prey writer Christina Hodson. Barbara Machete and Michael Disco are producing. Keaton, who had already been working with director Tim Burton in Beetlejuice in 1988, was selected by the director and late casting director of Warner Brothers casting boss Marion Doherty for his eyes. One source tells that this deal may not happen, but as right now, there are talks. So this this has been reported kind of all over the place. Um, I saw it all over Facebook. I mean, it's friggin' everywhere. Um, so um, I am a huge fan of the 89 Batman movie. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, I am a huge Michael Keaton fan. Um, initially, um, I had seen a lot of his early films like, you know, Mr. Mom, Gung Ho, um, you know, and then when they talked about casting him as Batman, I didn't have a huge negative visceral reaction, but I remember a lot of people being stunned by it and being kind of shocked by it. Uh, this show originally roll back the hands of time, or the, at least my intro into doing YouTube shows is actually in the studio retro retrospective. And on the Batman 89 episode, I shared, you know, some of the newspaper articles and different things because I have a lot of clippings from that time. I was a huge fan of this 89 movie um, and very, very um, huge. And it turned me into a huge Michael Keaton fan um, because of this. They had a magazine that actually came out with the 89 movie. And in it, they talked about his powerhouse role in Clean and Sober. Well, I actually searched out Clean and Sober and watched it and quite liked it. Um, even though it's a very downbeat sort of, you know, dramatic film. Um, but I'm a huge Keaton fan. I own, you know, uh, Clean and Sober, I own Pacific Heights. I think One Good Cop is a great movie. Um, I'm a huge fan of Michael Keaton just in general. I even watched that, that, that like, Love Bug reboot, too, just because Keaton was in it. Um, so the idea that Keaton could actually reprise his role as Batman is really cool. It'd be a really big deal for me. I would love to see him do that. Um, I'm kind of curious the context of this because uh, the reporting on this is is very much kind of in line with this same idea. But I'm also hearing there's this stuff where, like, theoretically, supposedly, somehow, the Flash movie still ties into elements of Flashpoint. Um, I did work on the Flashpoint series. I actually worked on one of the... Um, spin-off series from Flashpoint. I worked on Flashpoint Wonder Woman. Um, so I'm, I'm very kind of into the Flashpoint mythos. I'm, I'm very familiar with a lot of that. Um, so, oh, and then James Stone actually puts out Night Shift. Night Shift is a great movie. Great movie. Um, a movie that's not talked about. I, I think it's about almost been forgotten, except for you and I, James, I think. Um, but... Um, no, it, I'm very excited at this about this news, and and I, I really hope this comes to be, just because I had so much fun in the very brief amount of time that Kevin Conroy played Batman in the uh, Crisis event, um, even though he plays sort of like a spoiler alert. Well, I won't I won't throw the spoiler out there, but he, he's in Crisis. That was we covered that on the show. That's all over the news media. It's it's a different take on Batman than I expected, but I had a lot of fun with that. Um, so tell me, Eric, what are your feelings about this news that Michael Keaton actually might return to play Batman in a DC uh, film production? 
Well, it's funny, you know, I, I can't, I have to give full discretion. I, I remember growing up when uh, the Batman film was first announced and seeing that Michael Keaton was going to be in it, and I was kind of like, who? Uh, I hadn't seen Beetlejuice, which I think Beetlejuice came out before Batman. Did it come out, did it come out after? I can't remember. Um, but I can't, at the time, I didn't really know who Michael Keaton was. You know, I was pretty young, and, and he hadn't made any kind of impression on me uh, other than I kind of thought he was... You know, he looked like he was kind of balding. He didn't look like he was quite tall enough, you know, any of those kind of things. So I remember as a kid uh, not, you know, being like, who, you know, who's going to who's going to play Batman? Of course, once I went to the theater and actually watched it, I loved it. You know what I mean? And I thought he was awesome. So I was one of those people that that, you know, was was uh, I wouldn't say a detractor. I was just a little kid. And I was just like, who is this guy? I, I don't think I'd even seen Gung Ho. I've seen all those movies since, but I hadn't even seen that, I don't think, before before uh, Batman came out. So I, w- I was kind of shocked. By the way, One Good Cop is also an awesome film. I agree with that. That's, I love that's that movie. It's a, that's great. a great movie. That, that's a great movie. Um, but uh, th- that was, you know, as a kid, that that was my reaction. You know, since I've seen the, the film, you know, since seeing the film, I think he was a, a perfect, you know, perfectly cast. I do always argue, he, I don't think he's a great uh, Bruce Wayne. I always make that argument when I talk about, you know, good Batmans and, and stuff like that. I say, well, what about Bruce Wayne? Because a lot of these guys are not good Bruce Waynes, and he's not a good Bruce Wayne, in my personal opinion. But he's an excellent Batman. And I enjoyed both films. I, I love the the Batman film and Batman Returns. Both of them, I think, are superb films. I would definitely recommend them to anyone. So this, I think, is interesting. Uh, you know, you kind of touched on the fact that we don't know how solid this is. We don't know how much this is wishful thinking. And then, of course, we always we take the angle a lot on this program that sometimes the marketing department is just floating things out there. They're putting out deliberate sort of misinformation, but it could be real. Like if they get enough of a positive reaction, which I think they are, there's a tremendous amount of buzz. Um, but it's kind of interesting, too, because, you know, you know, you would think if negotiations are ongoing, that's putting Michael Keaton in a very good position when he's seen all these all this stuff trending and all that stuff and he can ask for some real big bucks if he hasn't already agreed to something because we don't know uh, we really don't know how far into the process this has gone so I, I'm, I'm i'm definitely interested to see how this plays out uh, i also saw that they were talking about using flashpoint as an inspiration for this story you know that it's going to be you know, obviously he's going to be introduced in the flash movie which I also think is interesting. And of course, this is a way to also sort of solidify the multiverse within the DCEU, because obviously the multiverse is solidified in the crisis event on the CW, you know, the DCCW universe, whatever you want to call that. Um, But it hasn't been necessarily solidified in the DCEU. Another interesting point, uh, one of the articles that I read was that people were talking about how this is a way also so that the Snyder Cut can kind of fit within the the DC EU because if the multiverse is basically established, then the Snyderverse is going to be easier to sort of explain and also to sort of put into the context of the other films. Uh, so it it, it, it kind of makes sense, and it, it also makes sense because of the way DC does things. Uh, you know, for for better or worse, and I honestly think a lot of times it's worse. Uh, DC doesn't like to have continuity between their shows. Uh, they do have the CW verse, but for instance, Gotham had nothing to do with anything in the CW. Originally, Supergirl didn't either. Supergirl was on a different network, and it had nothing to do with the CW universe. It got canceled, and they decided to punt the CW and incorporate it into the CW verse. Uh, and the same thing with the films. The films have nothing to do with the television shows. So this would be a way. This would be a way for them to sort of incorporate that if they would like to, uh, which I think is to me a no-brainer. But I've said that for a long time. I prefer the MCU approach over the DC approach. The DC approach is weird. Even as a kid, you know, I, I never quite understood. You know, e- even as a kid watching this Batman movie, the, the one with Michael Keaton, you know, I, w- I would ask myself in my head, well, where's Superman? You know what I mean? Where's, 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 where's everybody? Where's Robin? You know what I mean? Where's, where's everybody else? You know what I mean? Like, where, where's Wonder Woman? Uh, because, you know, I, I knew from the Super Friends, we talked about the Super Friends earlier. I knew that they all knew each other and they all existed in the same universe and they were all friends and all that kind of stuff. So I would be sitting there watching these movies and be like, where are all these people? 
you know, why isn't there any reference to any of them or anything like that? Well, DC and Warner Brothers have always done it that way for some reason. You know, e even with Man of Steel, even with Man of Steel, I remember in the marketing, they specifically said, well, well, you know, DC characters don't need to have the other characters. They can stand on their own. They're not weak like the, the Marvel characters where they have to be in teams. That was actually part of the marketing for Man of Steel. And then, of course, they had to eat all those words and say, no, 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 Man of Steel was a prequel, you know, to, to Batman versus Superman. You know, it, revisionism, complete 100% revisionism. That's why they don't fit. That's why those movies don't fit together. Um, so DC has always had this weird approach. But if they did this, this would be a good way to finally kind of fix that, or at least a good step into fixing that, in my opinion. Well, and, and I will highlight the crisis event uh, that the, the Arrowverse actually did um, because the, the crisis. Event, That's what they like to call the CW stuff. Arrowverse. Uh, there you Arrowverse. go. Yeah. It, it, it does. Uh, the crisis event did um, connect all the dots and say that all the different disparate, you know, DC television shows, movies, whatever, that they all exist essentially within, you know, um, quote unquote, a shared multiverse. Okay. Not necessarily a shared universe, but a shared multiverse. And that they all at one time were connected. Um, the big pivotal moment in uh, the flash one actually was actually the moment where the Ezra Miller, the justice league flash actually met the Grant Gustin TV flash. Um, thereby also saying that the DCEU, which that's been dubbed by the fans, DC never actually called it that, but um, even connecting the the, mo the current movies, you know, with the shows so that they exist in a multiverse, um, which to me, I always thought they should have done that anyway, um, I, because it, it plays into the ideas of the Christ and Infinite Earth, you know, comic book series, because in that, all those different versions of Superman, all those different versions of Batman over the years, they're all valid, they all exist, but they have their own you know, different timelines, their own different sort of, you know, quasi, you know, quote unquote realities in which that they exist. And a lot of these ideas were explored even explored even further, I think, in uh, Multiversity, I think it was called, which was a DC series they actually did somewhat recently. Um, and even Convergence, the Convergence series actually touched upon this concept as well. Um, so it all makes sense to me. I think it's really cool. It's interesting to see how the fans are lobbying. Some people like the idea that's put forth in this article as is, and they're like, hey, let's do that. Um, I've heard some people, you know, wondering, like, you know, is he playing, you know, Batman's dad version of Batman? Because in uh, Flashpoint, it's actually um, Thomas Wayne, who's the Batman. Um, and he's a very more brutal um, you know, more vigilante version of Batman than even the one we're familiar with. Although the Batman v Superman one's very much a vigilante version too. But that's another thing entirely. We're talking in terms of the comics. <laughs> um, but a lot of people are still lobbying. This has been going ongoing for a long time. A lot of people are lobbying for him to be old man Bruce Wayne and be connected to Batman Beyond. I see that constantly, constantly, constantly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've said a lot of people I think would like to see. No, so. I heard that too. Uh, yuck. Uh, that, to me, that's yuck. I have a lot of problems with Batman Beyond, huge problems with Batman Beyond. So I, I hope I, that's not what they're doing. I, if, I, 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 I've heard people say that too, but I just hope that's not what they're doing. I, I, I enjoyed Batman Beyond. I liked Batman Beyond uh, quite a bit. Um, but I'm going to say I would prefer that Keaton, if they do this, that he just be, that he just be Bruce, but like the same version from the Tim Burton movies, just older, move his story forward, um, and just bring him in to the, to the DCEU, you know, in this sort of, you know, role or capacity or whatever. I think it'd be, it could be really interesting. Um, but, but they, it does open it does create some problems for them too, story-wise. Like, how does that work? How does that relate to these other elements? Like, that does, you know, there'd be a lot of people like, you know, what we sometimes refer to as civilians. A lot of civilians are gonna be really taken aback and not understand what's going on. I mean, if you can't hang with the world building that happens in Green Lantern in two hours, 
I'm talking about the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern movie. If you can't take that, like that's too much for you, like all these different aliens with the power rings and not like and these entities and like if that's too much for you, there's no way in the world people are going to accept this idea that there's this multiverse and all these different things going on and this is another Batman from a pocket parallel universe and now he's in this one for this reason and that. Like I, I'm just saying, it's like if, if if people had a hard time hanging with Green Lantern, if they that I don't know how they're going to accept this. So, but we'll see, we'll see. It, and it causes weird problems too because um, I, I was looking forward to Matt Reeves' Batman. There, there's been a lot of negative things that, have, well, in my mind, in my opinion, there's been some negative stories that have spun out of that during the lock, the shutdown, the lockdown, or whatever things that are going on that, that don't don't sound right or don't gel with me that, that have kind of made me kind of look at that film differently now. Originally, I was very excited about it, but as we've gone on and all these different stories have come out, I'm, I, I find myself getting sort of apathetic about it and, and being sort of like, eh, okay, I guess we'll wait and see. Uh, but I'm not as excited about that production as I once was. But this, this sounds interesting to me if they do it right. But I worry about how the civilian, the casual moviegoer would be able to understand or accept what they're being told. You know, this is the Batman from a, a different Earth. What? <laughs> did he come on a rocket ship? <laughs> how, did, how does that work? You know, so well, ironically, I, Endgame might help them figure that out. Yeah, Endgame that's might help them totally figure that out and understand it. So right. Marvel once again paves the way for what DC should have been doing the entire time. Just going to say it. <laughs> but I'll say this too, without crisis that comes way before all of this, without the crisis event, um, I, I don't, I don't think you would have had what even happened in Endgame. So there, there's a lot of the snake eating its own tail going on here. You know, DC did a, broke a lot of this ground in the comics. You know what I mean? And then Marvel beat him to the bunch and broke this ground in live action and cinema, you know? So, so you're saying that Marvel comics never had any sort of parallel universe established before crisis. No, they've had, they had stuff, but it just, it wasn't to the extent of what crisis was. And, okay. Uh, you know, and, and you have to remember that crisis actually goes back further than that. It, it goes even further back. The, the earliest quote unquote crisis stories actually involved the Justice Society of America actually teaming up with the Justice League of America. And that predates a lot of this stuff going back to, I think, even the 60s or the 70s. So, um, you know, that, that, you know, DC broke a lot. All I'm saying is that DC broke a lot of ground with those ideas back in the day and sort of established kind of a lot of what we now just understand and accept as the concept of the multiverse. And then, you know, Marvel was able to, introduce that to a much larger audience you know what i mean and and was break it down with mirror, mirror? Was, huh? it mirror, mirror? was it before mirror mirror though <laughs> well, no. it, it, you have, uh, I, i'm not saying i'm saying in comics they broke a lot of that ground yeah initially. you know um you know trek we're not talking about trek that's a whole different other conversation obviously that stuff you know comes from mirror mirror and, and stories before but um but anyhow all i'm saying is that in the comics a lot of what we accept as the multiverse you know dc did a lot of that early work in the comics is all i'm saying um right. then and that's been built upon just like a lot of those concepts were built upon by what happened to mirror mirror you know what i mean like it, it's that idea is that everyone's kind of uh adding to and, and building upon so that when, you know, Marvel's able to do it live action, a lot of us have an understanding of what that is. So for those people who maybe didn't quite understand, we can turn to Aunt Betty and Uncle Jonathan and say, you know, well, here's what's going on. Let me pause it. Let me explain what's... It's like, oh, it's, oh, it's, I get Spock it. the, it's like Spock with the goatee. It's like Spock yeah, with the goatee. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, you know. But I do think I, I do want to bring this up since we're talking about this because I, I read this actually in one of the articles that I was reading that was trying to explain this to the civilians, as you say. 
And one of the points that they brought up was a lot of this just started because of the comics crash in the 1950s uh, when the comics code came about. Because what happened was tons and tons of comics were just destroyed. That's what happened to the original Flash in real life, to the original Green Lantern in real life. Their books were canceled. And so there's a lack of continuity between the original Green Lantern and then the Hal Jordan Green Lantern that came later, you know, in the 60s. So what happened was DC eventually was like, we got to fix this. You know what I mean? Because people are confused. The kids are confused. They don't understand, like, you know, some of them can remember or their parents can remember the original Green Lantern or whatever. And they're like, wait a second, how does this fit? You know what I mean? And you mentioned the Justice Society and the Justice League and the fact that they started making them work together almost as like separate teams. But of course, Justice Society had Superman and Wonder Woman and Batman. And those ones had been in constant publication the entire time. They never got canceled. So that was the mess that DC was trying to fix was because they had these characters, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman that had been in continuous publication, but then they redid they revamped characters like the flash and green lantern and others where they had an original version, you know, that they started back in the forties. And then when the silver age came, they redid them, they redid the characters completely. You know, in fact, I think uh, the flash, right. is considered the, the beginning of the silver age of comics was the debut of, of the new flash. So they, that's one of the issues that was also going on was that DC was trying to fix all those continuity problems. And then also too, uh, for those people that are that are into trademark and copyright law, um, so another aspect of this too is a lot of times they have to bring these older versions of the characters out and have them in quote unquote constant publication in order to maintain the trademarks, you know, the rights to the the different concepts and the costumes and whatever. They have to do that in order to maintain the intellectual property from a legal standpoint. So sometimes some of this stuff is sort of just to reinforce, you know, uh, the brand legally and get it all under a current copyright in order to push that, you know, however many years past whatever. I forget exactly how the law works at the current. I, I always have to look it up. But in order to keep them an, an active publication, to her in order to make sure that, that they can actually protect the the intellectual property that they quote unquote own. So that's how that's how they lost Captain Marvel. That's how yeah. basically DC lost Captain Marvel. That's why we call it Shazam now. Uh, which Shazam's not his name. Shazam's the name of the wizard. He's Captain Marvel. You know what I mean? But they lost the rights. Now we have, you know, Brie Larson's Captain Marvel. That's what happens. <laughs> you know. <laughs> It is what it is. So well, so anyhow, I wanted to bring this up as as the the you know this is pretty much my whole contribution for pop culture tonight. Um, I figured we'd talk about it. I I thought there'd be more activity from the rogues uh, about this particular topic. Um, everybody might have been talked to death on it on Facebook. This is the first I've really talked about it to be honest. Eric and I right now. I wanted to react to it when I first saw it, but. I wanted to actually save it for the show. So the, the, these are my thoughts on it. And, and I'm very excited at the idea of this. Um, like I said, I'm a huge Keaton fan and, and I hope this comes to pass. I thought he was great as the Vulture even just recently in Spider-Man. And I thought it was fun to see him actually return to that you know, sort of big blockbuster superhero movie and, and see him play a villain. I thought he was so great in it. Um, and and at moments, you know, when he isn't even in the suit, like that, the scene where he's got the 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 pistol and he's talking to uh, Peter in the car on the way to the prom or the dance or whatever, like he's terrifying. So I could see him playing that Thomas Wayne vigilante version of Batman and pulling it off like with no no problem whatsoever. But I could also see him just reprising his original version of Batman that he played in the Tim Burton movies too. So um, yeah have to wait and see what they do but but if they decided to have him play thomas wayne and go that direction that would be interesting uh, i think it'd be really interesting um and if they wanted to have a connection to other versions of batman you know if they go that route that that's a way they could kind of connect the dots if they want it so we'll have to wait and see what they do but i do hope this comes to pass in some form because i'd love to see keaton just back as batman again 
Um, just for me personally, I think that'd be a lot of fun. As long well, you're, as not the, you're not the only Keaton fan. James Stone says, my folks got uh, Mr. Mom and Gung Ho from the old double VCR exchange program. And James, I, I can say I'm not really familiar with the double VCR exchange program. <laughs> <laughs> you would have to explain that to me. But uh, yeah, I, I, I have seen Gung Ho and I, I do enjoy that film, but I, I didn't see it at the time that it came out. So years and years later as an adult. So well, like I said, the films I could definitely highly recommend if, if you like Keaton or if you're not terribly familiar. Um, obviously, the 89 Batman movie, um, I would highly recommend uh, One Good Cop, Pacific Heights. Um, and uh, if you want to see a just totally dramatic turn and you're not a, not afraid of something a little bit more, you know, sort of downbeat, uh, Clean and Sober is very interesting. Um, I think at one point he was... Uh, talked about possibly being nominated for an Academy Award for Clean and Sober, which at the time was a big deal because prior to that, a lot of people forget he'd been doing stand-up comedy prior to doing uh, Mr. Mom and Gung Ho. He was seen as primarily just a comedic actor. So it's very interesting to see how we think of him today versus, you know, the stand-up comedian that I originally saw like on the, the late night talk shows doing comedy. So... Oh yeah, I mean, obviously he he was a, he's one of those guys kind of like Tom Hanks that started out very much as a comedian, uh, and then you know got into more serious roles. There's no doubt about that. And James clarifies he's talking about old school VCR bootlegging, uh, okay. <laughs> which we were talking about earlier. We were talking yeah, about we the, were. Were. the convention center earlier. The corner of the convention. I am I am familiar with that. I am familiar with that. Yeah. <laughs> 